There are many different Batman Nightfall books. To avoid confusion, this review is for the novelization. It has no pictures. It was written by Dennis O'Neill in 1994. That's the version I will be reviewing. It's based on a really long storyline, which ran in the Batman comics for years. The copyright page informs me Gotham City is not New York City, and also, Pennsylvania doesn't exist. Good to know. Argofunk book review, Argofunk book review. Part 1. This story introduces Bane to the Batman universe. Bane is pretty careful and cautious. He does a lot of planning and observing Batman in action before he makes his move. There is a lot of detail about Bane's tragic backstory. He spent all of his life in a terrible prison with murderous inmates and torture-loving guards. It's amazing he didn't die before the age of 10. Since Bane has such a strong will, he survived when they performed experimental surgery on him. The goal was to make him into the ultimate super soldier. He has a massive, strong body, but the downside is that he needs a special drug named Venom to be injected into his brain every 12 hours. If you've seen the Batman movies or the TV shows that feature Bane, this should all sound pretty familiar. The weakest part of Bane's story, in my opinion, is his motivation. Bane's only goal in life is to go to Gotham City and kill Batman. He's going a quarter of the way around the world, to a country he's never been to, to fight a man he's never met. Why? He had a dream about a bat when he was younger. That's, uh, pretty much the only reason. He wants to symbolically conquer his fear before starting his quest for world domination. So Bane breaks out of prison with three henchmen, he presumably learns English at some point, and he goes to Gotham. Bane decides the best way to defeat Batman is to drive him to exhaustion. He does this by blowing up Arkham Asylum. A dozen villains escape, and honestly, there's a mass breakout at Arkham could have been a book all by itself. There's a lot of material to work with. Sadly, the book ignores most of the criminals. It focuses on Joker and three obscure villains I haven't heard of before. Like Amygdala. He's a rage-filled giant wrestler who gets his power from drugs shot directly into his brain. That sounds just like Bane. I wonder why the book decided to focus on the one villain who's most similar to Bane. Amygdala briefly teams up with the ventriloquist, they rob a toy store, and Batman knocks Amygdala out with a sleeper hold. The next enemy is an assassin named Mr. Z-S-A-S-Z. I don't know how you pronounce it. He takes hostages at a girl's school. He taunts Batman, saying they're both dark and they crave violence. Batman is shocked by how violently he dispatches with Mr. Z. Batman wonders if he's going out of control. Batman doesn't notice Bane is watching the whole scene from a helicopter. Bane sees the general neighborhood where the Batmobile goes to. Bane goes through pictures of everyone who lives in the neighborhood. He realizes Batman is Bruce Wayne. Dun dun dun. Alfred convinces Batman he needs to get a replacement, just in case something bad happens soon. Epic foreshadowing there, Alfred. Batman picks John Paul Valley. Who? John Paul appears to be a janitor at Wayne Enterprises. We see him practice some martial arts moves, and that is all the introduction we get to this character before Bruce Wayne takes him to the Batcave and tells him about Batman. I have a feeling Batman fans were really mad that Batman's replacement is some creep who's never been mentioned before. The book would have been much better if Batman's replacement was Nightwing, or Batgirl, or Batwing, or some other Batman character that people know about, not some random janitor. I'm told that Jean-Paul got a much bigger introduction in the comic version. I can believe that. It's hard to imagine him getting a smaller introduction. Seriously, there is only one page with Jean-Paul before Bruce Wayne shows up to offer him membership in the Batman Club. 
Batman is so focused on stopping the escaped villains, he goes without sleep for over a week. As a result, he becomes so exhausted, he is barely able to function. When Joker kidnaps the mayor and tries to flood a tunnel, Batman forgets what's going on and who he is. Batman only survives because Robin comes in to save the day. That's when Bane finally makes his move. He breaks into the Batcave and fights Batman. Batman is too weak and weary to successfully fight back. Bane drives Batman downtown. Bane roars he's now King of Gotham City as he kills Batman with his knee. Part 2. Surprise! Batman's not dead. He twisted to the side at the last second. Although he's alive, his back is broken and his spine is shattered. Robin and Jean-Paul arrive. They take Batman to get medical attention. Bane does nothing to stop them, and I'm not sure why. Jean-Paul becomes the new Batman, and we learn his backstory. He's a trained assassin for a shadowy organization of rich villains who have secretly controlled the world for centuries. Some call them the Illuminati, but their true name is the Court of Owls. I mean, um, uh, <clears throat> they are the Order of Saint Dumas. John Paul has been brainwashed by this order for his entire life. He believes he's an avenging angel named Azrael, and he regularly has hallucinations where Saint Dumas appears to him. John Paul is completely ignorant about many modern things, like television or cars. This is the guy that Bruce Wayne picked to be the next Batman? He picked the Illuminati's brainwashed assassin? Yeah, he can fight, but he's so obviously a terrible choice for the job, I have no idea why Bruce picked him. Jean-Paul proves to be overly violent. On his very first mission, he tries using a hammer to attack a criminal who's already surrendered. Robin has to hold him back from committing murder. Meanwhile, Bane has no idea what he's going to do with his life now that Batman is defeated. He tries taking over a local gang. Jean-Paul Batman just happens to go after the exact same gang at the exact same time. He crosses paths with Bane, culminating in a big fight, where he defeats Bane by ripping the tubes connected to Bane's head. I don't want to say the Bane and Jean-Paul story gets ignored in this book, but I will say it is definitely overshadowed by Bruce Wayne's story. Bruce falls in love with his doctor and next-door neighbor, Chandra Kinsolving. She can't help but love him back, even though she knows he's lying about his injuries. They kiss. Bruce decides he's going to marry her and live a happy retirement. Just when he's about to propose, Chandra is kidnapped, along with Robin's father. Bruce uses his great detective skills to determine the criminals took Chandra to a small town in England named Monkley. Bruce goes there with Alfred, in disguise as a wealthy old man named Sir Hemingford Grey. I'm not sure why Robin stays home for this adventure. Yeah, someone needs to keep an eye on John Paul Batman, but Robin's father was kidnapped, and Bruce Wayne's back was broken less than two weeks ago. He can't even walk across the street without great effort. This is not the right time for Bruce to embark on a solo mission. It is a solo mission for most of the time. Alfred quits his job about halfway through, and we never see him again. Alfred? Chandra's backstory is slowly revealed over the next 90 pages as Bruce Wayne finds out more and more about the mystery. This review is going to be pretty long as it is, so I'll just give the quick version of Chandra's story. She has psychic powers which can be used to heal people. As a child, her powers accidentally killed her abusive stepfather. She was so traumatized, she went into hiding and vowed to never use her powers again. Her evil stepbrother uses drugs and blackmail to control her powers. This gives him the ability to kill anyone, anywhere in the world. He plans to make billions by killing world leaders. Bruce manages to stop the villains. Like many villains who discover Batman's true identity, they die in ways which are totally not Bruce's fault. Chandra uses her powers to completely heal Bruce's broken back. Not that it's been much of an impediment to him. 
I'm sure the two of them will get married in... Part 3. Chandra doesn't appear again. The epilogue tells us she's regressed to a childlike state. Bane has also lost his memory. So Bruce's heart may be broken, but his secret is safe. Jean-Paul Batman has joined forces with Detective Harvey Bullock, who likes his violent style. Bullock gives Jean-Paul tips about criminal activity, which leads Jean-Paul to Abattoir, the last of the Arkham escapees. This part really demonstrates how incompetent Jean-Paul is compared to Bruce Wayne. Bruce isn't perfect, but at least he's observant enough to notice when a bus full of school kids is about to fall off a cliff. Jean-Paul has to be told that's happening ten feet away. Jean-Paul takes Bruce's return badly, and he murders Abattoir. Bruce knows Jean-Paul must be stopped, so he travels to the fictional state of Pennsylvania. He gets martial arts training from Lady Shiva, in a segment with a lot of unnecessary nudity. Good thing 13-year-old Robin stayed home. Jean-Paul loses his grip on sanity when going up against the man who killed his father. Bruce has to stop Jean-Paul from killing again. They have an epic battle in the Batcave, and actually, no. Bruce defeats Jean-Paul by crawling through a narrow tunnel. Jean-Paul is forced to remove the Batman costume piece by piece until he realizes he's not Batman. If only Bruce could defeat all his enemies through the power of symbolism. The end. Post-book follow-up. I like this book. I thought it was a really good story, and it kept my attention the whole time. I could definitely see a version of the story being made into a movie. I say version because they would have to make big changes. Poor Jean-Paul was a total misfire. It could have been cool to have a different Batman, but he was not introduced well. He came across as mentally unstable for most of the book. I have no idea why Bruce Wayne ever trusted this stranger to become Batman, especially when there are many other, better choices. Maybe Jean-Paul was better in the comics, and he was portrayed as a good character, somebody you want to see succeed as Batman. Or maybe he was a transparent villain the whole time, and it was super obvious Bruce Wayne would come back to replace him. It is a tough balancing act. Jean-Paul needs to be good enough to be considered a legitimate replacement, while still being bad enough that everyone wants to see him defeated in Part 3. This book leans more heavily on the side of Jean-Paul being so bad, everyone wants to see him defeated. There is a subplot which mostly takes place off-screen, I'm not sure I could fully describe it without YouTube flagging this video as adult content. Let's just say Bane murders 12 women who work in a certain profession. He frames Batman for the deaths by drawing bat symbols. Now the police want to take Batman in for questioning. The story about Batman being framed for murder is not fully developed. It only comes into play twice, then it gets ignored for several hundred pages. It would definitely change the book if this story had been fully developed. Part 1 was the best part of the book. I kind of wish the entire book had been just Part 1, with the rest as a sequel, because I wanted to see more of those Arkham escapees. Part 3 was the weakest part. A decent amount of it felt like it was just drawing things out until the inevitable fight between Bruce and Jean-Paul, which was an underwhelming battle. Overall, I'm glad I read this book. Now I want to read more epic Batman stories. I give Batman Nightfall an 8 out of 10.